I would like to introduce you Professor Mike Wright. He is the head of the Innovation Entrepreneurship Group in Imperial College. He is also the director of the Center of Management Buyout Research. Um, for that, he was a professor of finances, financial studies at the University of Nottingham. Um, has written over 40 books and more than 300 papers in academic and professional journals of management, buyouts, venture capital, uh, entrepreneurship, academic, academic entrepreneurs, and so um, He's going to give us a talk about how to move from the research in uh, the bench in the lab to the real business world and hope you enjoy it and please help me welcome. <laughs> well, well thank, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I feel as though I've come 100 yards but uh, come to another planet um, so forgive me that uh, I understood about three words of uh, the previous presentation which are fascinating. The two of the words I understood were stone and age. Um, hopefully um, You'll understand a bit more of uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, my, my research centre is a centre for management buyout research. And um, as a, an indicator for most of you who are either just finishing your PhD or uh, in the middle of it, um, when I started this centre uh, many years ago, uh, when I was a very junior faculty member, my head of department told me I was wasting my academic career on this. Um, so for 30 years later, I've, I've been wasting my career. So... There are things that you can do, and if you've got the right kind of notion that you believe in it, you can make it work, so uh, believe in your research. I'm going to talk about um, academic entrepreneurship. Um, particularly, I'm going to talk about creating companies from your research. Uh, in particular, that can be uh, companies based on patents, intellectual property, formal intellectual property, particularly with scientists like yourselves creating it. But it can also be a company that's created with... Uh, Informal intellectual property, uh, which is, as I say, not patent-based. Uh, in other words, we can have different sorts of uh, created spin-offs uh, from these ventures. And incre increasingly, we see startups by students, not just by established faculty members. Uh, just to give you a broad idea of what's happening, the, the line down here is um, the number of spin-offs. Uh, using formal IP in the UK over the last uh, decade. So you can see roughly about 200 a year, just a slight increase lately, uh, which means that um, the, 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 uh, the total active ones are kind of growing cumulatively like that, and those that have been active for more than three years are a little bit lower down. In other words, they don't all uh, become successful. Many do, but uh, many are going to fail. Seems to work. Just give you examples of companies that have been very successful. Uh, you're obviously familiar with Google and Yahoo and so on, which uh, came out of places like Stanford uh, in the States. Closer to home, you can see some of these other cases here. Um, some of them from uh, Imperial, some from elsewhere. You can see that uh, these are companies that have been sold or listed on the stock market. Um, so here we have a $330 million sale of this company. Proximogen raised 75 million when it went to the alternative investment market and then recently was sold for $555 million. Um, Cangam, which I always want to call, um, it sounds very similar to a well known uh, song and dance that came out uh, at the end of last year, so slightly different perhaps. Um, that also was recently sold. Respivert, which is um, Discovering inhaled medicines, which I thought was something to do with glue sniffing, but uh, apparently it's rather more sophisticated. But uh, you can see um, 70 million dollars there, pounds rather. Uh, and Renovo, which is um, to do with uh, uh, developing material uh, uh, um, to, to get rid of scar tissueing, uh, and that went to an IPO, and in, a stock market listing for about 200 million dollars. So you can see uh, some of these things can uh, generate. Uh, a lot of dosh, as we say, in the technical language. Okay. However, it's worth bearing in mind at this point that not all of these spin-offs create the vast revenue that universities are trying to generate from the science. Uh, this is up here. Okay. On the sales of shares in spin-offs 
is just this kind of tip of the uh, icing on the cake, if you will. Uh, most uh, comes from contract research, collaborative research, uh, consultancy up here, and so on. So although it's an additional part of revenue streams for university, it's by no means, uh, by no means the, the only one. So what helps to generate the, the rewards um, to this kind of uh, spin-off? What, what tends to be most likely to succeed? Well, there's a whole stack of studies been done, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but first of all, you're going to have the science. Uh, typically, uh, a university that's got a very strong uh, research reputation, like here and so on, and faculty quality, star scientists. And this, it sometimes suggested that there's a kind of a conflict between being a star scientist and being a star entrepreneur. And studies suggest that that's not the case. Uh, you can quite easily uh, combine both. So uh, you don't have to uh, stick with your impoverished uh, uh, academic scientist. You can become uh, uh, rich, if you will. Um, the entrepreneur, um, that uh, access to surrogate entrepreneurs, what does that mean? Well, it, it means it's a bit like surrogate mothers, I suppose, but legal. Um, what it means is that uh, you, you, get a, you, you get an entrepreneur who's a scientist, and uh, because you've not got commercial experience, then what you do is you have a network of commercial uh, contacts, and the surrogate is the entrepreneur who comes in and basically takes the place of the scientist to make this thing work. So it's very important to have that kind of contact. Also, within departments, you may have not just scientists who are thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, but some who have actually started it, but also some who, who besides uh, publishing lots of papers, may also be habitual academic entrepreneurs. They spin off a lot of activities from their, their science and they can actually help uh, people who are just starting down that road. And then it's very important to create a team and have a coach or a privileged witness to be able to, to take that science down the market, to the market. And then the strategy of the university counts because some universities just think it will happen. Um, in fact, you, you need a rather more uh, structured way to... Uh, to making this work. Now, I mentioned the examples are successful, but of course, um, entrepreneurship is very risky. Um, so uh, just as an example of something that may not work, is, uh, sounds a brilliant idea, but maybe to make it really work, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, quite to get there. So I'll give you an example of actual company. Um, I mentioned Renovo a few minutes ago. This is what happened to Renovo. Um, so, Renovo in 2000, this was created at the University of Manchester by uh, a professor, um, I always want to call him Alex Ferguson, because he was obviously, but he's another genius. Uh, it's Mark Ferguson, um, but uh, anybody called Ferguson uh, is a genius, particularly if he's called Alex. Um, now, he, that, that company raised two, 8 million from a venture capitalist in the year 2000. Three years later, it raised another 23 million. And then three years after that, it came to the stock market for a market capitalization of 240, 204 million. Sorry. Uh, and what happened then, before it had even produced any product that it sold, okay, everything was going through uh, the lab, through the clinical trials. It had not got to the stage of actually selling a product. Okay? Following that, that uh, flotation, there's a lot of positive news that the drug trials were succeeding. Uh, you know, obviously take a long period of time. And you can see that the share price, well, almost doubled in about 18 months. Okay. Uh, that was because the idea was that if this was successful, then there was a $12 billion market worldwide per year in, in sales revenue. However... A little bit later on, it became clear that the sale, the trials had failed, and you can see what happened to the share price. It fall, fell off a cliff. Uh, it then became clear that a whole sack of problems. Even um, by early, or well, sorry, late 2010, early 2011, this company was still worth 138 million, still not having sold a, a product. Right? Uh, it then had a bit of better news. And then, latterly, um, it's become clear that this thing isn't going to work. Uh, Ferguson um, has uh, resigned. 
uh, and the company has actually sold off uh, its licenses. So although th this company was actually generate a lot of cash, and if you, uh, if you sold your shares up here and, and retired to somewhere exotic like, like Manchester uh, to, watch, to watch United, um, then uh, fine, but um, otherwise uh, it, it's a very risky business. Okay. So one of the problems is to actually make these things work really, really relates to the university level. And as I said earlier, and one of the problems is actually having the right kind of structure in place at the universities to enable these things to work. Now, you can do this with three broad categories. So you can have a, what you might call a true incubator, which is a, a, a way of bringing in very specialist uh, uh, finance as well as uh, skills to, to develop this activity. So it's really for the high level um, patented uh, intellectual capital. Or you can have something that's fairly low level in the sense of it's perhaps basic consulting, uh, but again, you can generate viable businesses. The problem is that many universities try to um, do this kind of thing, but actually don't bother putting the, the resources in. And so the thing doesn't work. Now, I think Imperial is a good example where that's not the case, but system-wide, uh, that is quite a problem. Departments can also play an important role. And I, and I don't know anything about your departments uh, that you're in, but uh, some departments are rather more predisposed towards supporting this kind of thing than others. Um, which may mean that the, the department is quite distinct and disconnected from a university policy, but it may also mean that within a, un a department you may have a, a culture, if you like, that's very much research-oriented and doesn't really want to have anything to do with this dirty, this dirty thing called money. Okay? Uh, and I think that can create a lot of uh, restrictions on an ability to, to create these, uh, uh, the, these spin-offs. But if you have got a situation that is supportive, then scientists who have developed spin-offs are actually a good way of helping new uh, entrepreneurs to actually develop their activities. And if you can connect with your alums then who've perhaps become uh, entrepreneurs, that's also another good way of, of creating uh, value from this, this science. The spin-off, though, as a kind of the Renovo case kind of illustrates, uh, are not kind of born immaculately uh, conceived in terms of a, a commercial venture. It takes a long time to get from the lab to something that is, is sustainable. Uh, and we, we, diagrammatically, we would look at it like this, in that the, we can think of different stages in terms of where well, you've got the research in the lab, but thinking, well, what is the opportunity from a commercial sense? We've seen some great ideas earlier on this afternoon uh, about uh, the science, but where's the commercial opportunity? We had some hint, hints at that, but um, uh, that may take a while to, to work out. You then need somebody who's going to be committed to it entrepreneurially, not just from a science point of view. One of the big problems in this area is that scientists very often see these as a way of getting money to to do the research rather than getting money to do the commercial side of it. And there's a big difference there. Very often after that, there's a whole iterative process, which is what all these boxes are meant to mean, in between actually saying, well, where is the market? Who wants to buy this science? And the big problem is that when you get something that's very novel, it may not be immediately clear where the customers are. It may not be immediately clear what the product is. And that process is very often where a lot of the science can break down from a commercial point of view. And that's really where you need some kind of commercial input to, to the science. And this is where this comes in. Uh, because one of the big problems is that, is A, in recognising that you need more than just the scientists, but actually you need folks who've got different perspectives. Okay? And you can see this. We need to focus on diversity. Your goal is to go hire people who all look different but think just like me. Now, is that a great way to go forward or not? Well, I think one of the, this problem is you've got to create teams and boards of directors in these companies who've got this mix of commercial and technical skills. So you don't throw away the technical skills because, well, because you need that to help to develop the product, but without the commercial side of it, then uh, it ain't going to work. Now, Mark Ferguson, that I mentioned earlier, is probably a good example of somebody who actually can straddle both fields, but a lot of, um, a lot of scientists find that quite a challenge and may 
find it quite a challenge to accept that they don't know how to do it. Okay. Uh, the proximaging case is an example where, as I say, that uh, I mentioned earlier, where it was set up um, at King's, uh, had an IPO, um, and where the venture capitalists who funded it actually were very important in putting in place a board of directors with the skills to be able to, to get this thing to, to the commercial context. Okay? So needing new directors from outside who said, well, think about developing the license in this technology, think about developing contractual research and development, and building an alliance with a large pharmaceutical company rather than trying to develop it solely from developing a particular product because of the risks involved in uh, developing those products as we saw uh, with the Renovo case. Okay. Raising finance, though, is in itself a pretty big challenge. And, and again, this is a kind of a classic uh, cartoon of uh, the problems in raising finance for these, these kind of activities. The venture capitalists will say, well, we want something that's in innovative, but they then say, well, it's too innovative, it's too risky. Okay? So uh, one of the big issues then is, well, how do we actually ov overcome that? And that's a particular issue, I think, for uh, products and science coming out of universities because almost by its nature, it's, uh, it's not particularly commercial, and, and therefore there's this big step to make from the lab to, to the product. Um, and so what tends to happen is, a lot of issues to do with, well, what is the market? It, it, this has not been a market there before. Is this thing very early, very early developed? Can you really see what the product is? Uh, and that's a big problem for venture capital firms is, is this thing investor ready, we would say, or is it still too early? We can't envision what the market is. And then very often problems within the university in actually being able to connect between the, the science and, and the venture capital providers. Um, so, so what that means is that universities particularly need to build links with venture capital firms, but also business angels, so wealthy individuals, um, and also uh, accelerator programs which are starting to develop now, which enable uh, science, not just patented science, but also more informal uh, science to, to actually start to create a venture. And one of my students um, on our MSc in Innovation Entrepreneurship course last year uh, recently won a prize for uh, an accelerator called Seed Camp for, for his project that he'd been developing last year, um, which uh, they thought was going to have the, the best impact. So this is kind of an example of being able to, to go from uh, the classroom or the laboratory to... Um, to the commercial environment. So can I just finish then? I think what we're seeing is the way in which uh, entrepreneurship and, and science is developing is beyond this, um, what I would call direct academic entrepreneurship, the, 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 the patent-driven research and creative spin-offs from that, to a more indirect approach, which is very much focused on science that's not patentable, very often in the, the IT area, but where students like yourselves may be developing uh, ideas for products, uh, where students have gone and worked for corporations and done what CSOs is corporate spin-offs, and where alums have actually gone and started off directly from, uh, from their, uh, their studies. Uh, this uh, example up here is a, you may have come across this, is a a student when I was at Nottingham called Alex Stew, an undergraduate, who uh, made a million dollars, uh, which funded his, uh, funded his uh, studies, I mean, which is a lot of beer, uh, but um, uh, who sold, uh, I think it's a million pixels on this thing here uh, at, a, at a dollar a piece <clears throat> uh, and uh, created a venture that way. And of course, as we all know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who, um, who did the, kind of the ultimate way by... Uh, by dropping out of university and making a few bob. So uh, there are these different ways that we can think about entrepreneurship from academia, which is not simply the, the hard science, if you like. And I think that for the future, this kind of balancing of this direct creation of spin-offs to this more indirect 
perhaps not doing it at the time of uh, your studies, but subsequently is another way in which we can promote entrepreneurship from, from academia. And uh, our MSc course in the business school uh, is particularly designed for students who, who want to, to pursue that kind of route. We have a, a lot of them who, uh, who are starting up these businesses and uh, who knows in the fullness of time uh, they may make uh, quite a bit of money. So I'll stop there and uh, do we have time for questions? If this thing stops. Yeah. Thank you. What I'm trying to illustrate was that, um, uh, without denying that uh, there are issues for, the, if you like, the hard science, pharmaceutical, and so on, is actually say, well, there is actually variety in the way in which we can uh, approach this academic entrepreneurship. And, but there is a, a big, ch well, all sorts of big challenges for kind of the pharmaceutical end of things. Uh, one of the problems is actually, I think one of the problems is, is, is not just that the Early, very early stage. I think there's a, a fair bit of evidence that this very early stage is, can be actually reasonably well funded. One of the big problems, what we might call is the, uh, the death valley uh, between your initial, very initial funding and getting the, the big venture capital to take you through the stage you were describing. The, the, that's really where the gap is, I think, because you, you have a situation, you can get the thing rolling, but you then burn all your money perhaps almost literally, uh, before you actually get to a stage that it's clearly identifiable for the venture capitalists. And that is a, it's a particular problem in the UK, some, it may, it, perhaps less of a problem perhaps in the US, but even there it's, it's, um, it's a big problem. Uh, and, uh, so that, yeah, and it's an almost intractable problem because of the risk side of it. Uh, uh, so I think there's, it's an unresolved issue. Um, and... Um, you can just kind of partly deal with it, possibly if you if you've got something that you can tell a strong enough upside story uh, that you can actually get to the stock market, even if you haven't generated a product. But you can see Re Renovo, e even that may uh, may fall flat on its face. But yeah, it's a it's a very serious issue that uh, we've been trying to resolve since the 1930s, and uh, we ain't got there yet. That's a question. Why, why Oh no! The, no the ca well, the cash flow. Uh, it, well, I mean, cash flow. It wasn't generating cash from from products because it never got to that stage. It was generating some cash from from the license from licensing the technology. If I make that distinction, uh, but it actually because it had raised a lot of money uh, from uh, various uh, issues of shares um, as it was going along, uh, then it actually had pretty significant cash balances. So it, it wasn't that it, in that case, eventually, it wasn't that it ran out of cash. Uh, it was really that the technology didn't prove. Um, and so e e even though they had a kind of a pipeline of um, products coming along, uh, because, you know, obviously the, the issue is you know, it's very risky, the first one, so you try to build a, a pipeline. Uh, even, even those didn't, um, didn't come through in the end. It, it looked like they were going to be successful, but in the end they decided it was going to kill people, so perhaps they wouldn't perhaps go along with it. So, so in the end, it was right at the, 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 the phase three trials, right at the end that it, it, it fell over. Can I ask you something? Of the number of pharmaceutical startups, how did you know what percentage have been successful? 
uh, I, I haven't got a precise figure, but I would say uh, pretty well. Successful in what sense? Successful can. Sorry. Well, well, the reason I can qualify is because one of the problems is that uh, a lot of these things um, don't fold, but they don't go anywhere. What we would call the living dead, uh, in the sense of very often these things are kept alive simply because the scientists. Um, um, pet project or ego wants to keep these things alive, but don't really go in it. So leave that, a lot of those aside. Uh, you may actually get a number of them that never, like uh, Renovo, actually produce a product, but you can actually sell the technology to an incumbent pharmaceutical com company. So a lot of those would go, go was get sold that way. As you can see from my slide, a lot that kind of representation of a lot of them being sold is very often what happens. So the ones that actually get floated on the stock market is very few. Yeah. Probably less, probably... I'm going to gamble. What, what, are the, what are my odds of getting my money back? Making a million pounds. Uh, making a million pounds. Well, the... Uh, let me... Of um, probably... Uh, of those that get funded by venture capitalists, it probably about 10% would be uh, successful. Now, if you go back one stage further, of those that uh, would approach venture capital firms, probably less than 5% would get venture capital funding. So do the math, as they say. So 0.5% uh, or whatever uh, would be successful. And, and, that's a kind of, and that's a typical profile. So from a venture, if you think of it from a venture capital firm's point of view, what they're back banking on, or gambling on, if you want to put it, is that, that they'll get 1 in 10 that are going to be highly successful, the rest are either going to be moderately or living dead or, or failures. Because of the uncertainties I've been describing, that even going through this whole process and trying to understand the science and match it up with the market, the uncertainty of where the market is and whether the science is going to work means that some of these are not going to fail. Uh, they're not going to succeed, they're going to fail. So it's a risk business. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>